everything we experience, we experience through our consciousness. If we're not conscious, we're not experiencing anything. So in that sense, for each of us as individuals, consciousness is our primary reality. And yet consciousness is a complete mystery. The conventional view, at least from a Western materialistic scientific perspective, is that the brain produces consciousness. But there are many, many reasons to believe that this might not be the case and to instead consider the idea that consciousness might not be produced by the brain at all. Hi everyone, my name is Georgia. I'm currently studying a master's degree in consciousness, spirituality and transpersonal psychology. Now, one of my favourite things to study on this degree and in my spare time is the mystery surrounding consciousness. And in this video, I'm going to talk about the reasons why consciousness might not be produced by the brain. So I want to start by examining this materialistic idea that the brain produces consciousness consciousness by firstly looking at what are brain activities and how could these lead to consciousness. So basically what is happening in the brain? So we know that the brain contains billions of neurons and these neurons communicate with each other through an electrical process. So essentially the brain creates an electric current. Now this electrical activity can be measured. This is what we measure on an EEG that measures our different brain waves. So that's all of the different brain wave states like alpha and theta, beta, delta. These different brainwave states are just different patterns of electrical activity that's happening in the brain that can be picked up on an EEG. So this is a physical process that's happening in the brain. It's something that we can measure. And all of this electrical activity that is happening correlates to our conscious experience. Now, when it comes to consciousness, there are many different aspects of consciousness, many different aspects of our conscious experience, whether, for example, it be information processing or the transitioning between different types of brainwave states. So like transitioning between wakefulness and sleep, for example, or also our ability to focus our awareness on different things. These are all different functions of consciousness, which correlate to different aspects of this activity that's going on in the brain. So these different functions of consciousness correlate to different aspects of brain activity. Now these are called neural correlates of consciousness, and these explain what are called the easy problems of consciousness. But there is also the hard problem of consciousness, and this is explaining how consciousness is produced in the first place. The problem is that consciousness is metaphysical. Just think for a second about what it is like to be conscious. What does it feel like to be conscious? What do your thoughts feel like? They may correlate to different aspects of brain activity, but they certainly don't feel physical. They seem to have a very different nature to anything physical. So this is where there is this big gap between these processes happening in the brain and consciousness. This is the explanatory gap. Ultimately, our brain being a physical thing boils down to physical particles and subatomic particles. Now, these physical particles seem to be of a very different nature to our experience of consciousness. So how do we get from those particles to consciousness? This is the great mystery. This is the hard problem of consciousness. Typically, when something is a product of something else, that end product is somehow inherent within the thing that created it in the first place. So if we apply this to consciousness, we would have to assume that somehow consciousness is already inherent within the particles that make up our brain. Now, this would be a panpsychist view, the idea that consciousness is somehow another fundamental property of an atom, just like charge or like spin, and that through all of these atoms coming together and creating ever more complex organisms, somehow this consciousness kind of comes together and creates the consciousness that we see in individual organisms. Now that's just one example of panpsychism, but what's important to note here is that panpsychism is different to materialism, because materialism isn't assuming that consciousness is somehow a fundamental property of matter. Instead, materialism assumes that consciousness is an emergent property of matter. So somehow these physical processes happening in the brain just give rise to consciousness as a secondary phenomenon. And as I mentioned, no one has ever managed to explain how that might be possible. And maybe the reason no one's managed to do that is because consciousness maybe isn't produced by the brain at all. Maybe we're looking in completely the wrong direction. Now, what if instead of looking at consciousness as a product of the activity happening in the brain, we go a bit deeper and look at consciousness as potentially being a product of the quantum processes happening in the brain? Hammerhoff and Penrose actually came up with a theory suggesting exactly this. Now, this theory is called objective reduction. So their theory is based on microtubules. Now, microtubules are very small subunits of proteins in the brain. They're basically on a quantum scale. So very, very tiny little things that are in the brain. Now, these microtubules can exist in two different states. 
Now, in quantum physics, we know that a subatomic particle can exist as both a particle and a wave. And when it's in a wave, it's in a superposition of different states. So it's in multiple states at once. Now, according to the conventional theory within quantum physics, the one that's most accepted, this superposition of states collapses into one finite thing. It collapses into a physical particle. So what Hameroff and Penrose suggest is that these microtubules that exist in two different states, they suggest that they exist in a superposition of both states and that this superposition of states collapses into one of the two different states and that consciousness is somehow produced from this collapse. Now this theory faces exactly the same problem as the other materialistic theories I talked about which basically just try and derive consciousness from brain activity. The question is why on earth would this collapse of microtubules produce consciousness? Essentially it's exactly the same question we had before about materialistic theories. We can't understand how these physical processes would produce consciousness because they are seemingly two very different substances. Now, they might not be two different substances, but at least from our current understanding, they seem so different in nature that it is very hard to understand how one might come from the other. So that's essentially the idea of consciousness that comes from materialism. Basically, that consciousness is somehow a physical product of the brain, whether that be activity happening in the brain or whether it be the actual quantum processes happening in the brain. Now, as we've discussed, one major problem to this is the explanatory gap. No one can explain how we get from those physical processes to consciousness. But another big problem to this materialistic idea of consciousness is psychic phenomena or psi phenomena. So we have telepathy, for example, where two people's thoughts or minds seem to be connected somehow. Another example of an unexplained phenomenon is out of body experiences. And I've had one of these myself and what happens during an out-of-body experience is, is it really feels like your consciousness is actually separating from your physical body. Now ultimately we don't know what's happening during these experiences but they certainly give us a strong reason to at least explore the idea that consciousness is not confined to the skull as materialism would assume because if the brain produces consciousness then that would assume that our consciousness or our mind is confined within our skull which makes it very difficult to explain phenomena like telepathy where it seems like people's minds are connecting to each other somehow or out of body experiences where it feels like your consciousness is actually somehow separating from your body. And there have been cases of people who have reported on things that they've seen during these out of body experiences, which have later been verified to be correct. Now, the evidence of that is very slim, but there is reason to believe it has happened. And if it has happened, that certainly questions this materialistic view of consciousness. Now, another example of a phenomena that really questions this materialistic view of consciousness is near death experiences. Now, these are similar to out-of-body experiences in the sense that people experience separating from their body. But the key difference is that near-death experiences, as suggested by their name, happen when someone has died. So they happen when someone has died and then they're later resuscitated. And after they've been resuscitated and brought back to life, they talk about these really amazing transpersonal experiences that they've had when there was no activity happening in the brain or at least no detectable activity happening in the brain. Now these experiences might be the biggest problem for the materialistic view of consciousness because if the brain produces consciousness how on earth can people be having conscious experiences when they are brain dead? Now some people suggest that maybe there is some brain activity that's happening that's just really really low so our instruments can't pick up on it but again this doesn't really work very favorably for the materialistic viewpoint because if the brain does produce consciousness then you would expect different conscious experiences to correlate to different levels of brain activity so the greater of a conscious experience you're having you would expect there to be more brain activity going on and the less of a conscious experience you're having you would expect there to be less brain activity going on so Again, even if there is some brain activity going on during near-death experiences, it still leaves a very big question as to how on earth they're happening. Because it really questions the assumptions we would make as to how the brain would produce consciousness. So clearly there are phenomena which at the very least should make us question this materialistic assumption that the brain produces consciousness. But if, as I'm suggesting, that the brain might not be the cause of consciousness, then why does consciousness seem to correlate so closely with brain activity? Now, an argument that comes up a lot of the time with regards to the brain producing consciousness is the idea of brain damage. Because what seems to happen when people suffer brain damage is that they seem to also suffer cognitive impairments. So it seems that damage to the brain also affects our consciousness, which if taken at face value might seem to imply that our consciousness is a result of brain activity. 
but if we look at this from a different perspective then it is not that clear. So to make this point I want to use the analogy of a TV. So a TV is a physical machine and in this analogy you think of the TV set as your physical brain. Now I also want you to think of the program that's coming out of the TV set, whatever it is that you're watching on TV, think of that as your consciousness. So we know that when it comes to a TV, when it is playing a specific program, that the TV didn't actually produce that program or that movie, that TV show, whatever it is that you're watching. That TV show or movie was already produced way before you were watching it on TV. It was produced by actors and directors and people who filmed the movie and then edited it and put it all together. That movie or TV show was created first and then it was aired on TV. So that TV set did not produce that movie or that TV show. All that TV does is tune into it. And yet, if you break or damage aspects of that TV set, then that might affect the program that is coming out of the TV. You might have distortions with the colour or with the sound, or you might lose the TV show or program altogether. So let's say that some being is watching TV that never knew how the program was created in the first place. If that being saw some damage to the TV, result in distortions or interruptions to whatever it is they're watching, then they might assume that that TV set produced that TV programme or TV show. And yet we know that that's not the case. Now this is exactly why the fact that brain damage leads to different cognitive impairments does not prove that consciousness is produced by the brain. Now I don't know if consciousness works in the same way that a TV does, but let's just assume for one second that it does. Let's assume that the brain is acting like a TV or like a radio and it is essentially receiving consciousness and transmitting it in a certain way then damage to the brain might affect the brain's ability to receive the consciousness, which would lead to different cognitive impairments. So if we view brain damage from this perspective, we can see that brain damage resulting in these different impairments doesn't necessarily mean that consciousness is a product of brain activity. But it does still make sense that consciousness would highly correlate to brain activity. In the case of the TV, we know that whatever processes are happening in the TV are somehow going to correlate to the programme or TV show that is being seen. So in both of these cases there is correlation but not necessarily causation. Now ultimately I do not know what the answer to consciousness is but I hope all of the reasons that I've just suggested at least can give you a reason to question the materialistic worldview. I'm not saying that it is necessarily wrong, it might turn out to be right, but there is a lot of reason to at least consider other worldviews. We are certainly not in a place where we can claim that consciousness is definitely a result of brain activity, which unfortunately a lot of materialists do seem to claim. So I hope that this video was interesting and gave you something to think about. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.